All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, this is a subset of the members of the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace, and you're going to hear us uh, make some opening comments uh, from our perspectives of uh, what we think the challenges are, and then we're going to get into sort of a conversation amongst us. And my hope is that you'll be left with a feeling of listening to a conversation of of uh, some subject matter experts having a debate. And you can really see like the edges, the contours of where we agree and where we don't agree, where the challenges are and what we sort of consider as uh, settled issues. And then we'll hopefully be able to go to questions in the audience. And so I really don't like panels where everybody just reads a set piece. I like it when you feel like you're kind of in a conversation, eavesdropping in a conversation, and then you get to join the conversation later. So that's what I'm going to aim for. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to start all the way on my left with, uh, with Joe Nye, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about his experience and his perspectives, and they'll just work down the line. When we, when we get to the end, we're going to uh, start our conversation. So pretty simple, straightforward, and let's kick it off. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, let me start uh, by picking up where you left off this morning at that very impressive keynote session in which you said that defense is a combination of technology and social. And the interesting thing is that the social is by far the harder part of it. And when you think of that at the international level, it's squared. So the question is, can we develop norms for the internet and would that help to reduce conflict? Basically, there's a general view that the cyber world is a wild west in which there are no norms. But in fact, that's not quite true. There are islands of norms in many parts of international relations in the cyber domain. Uh, if you take the domain name system, there is a pretty coherent regime focused around ICANN now. Uh, if you look at trade, there are norms that are imported from other aspects of trade law. If you look at issues of crime, there is a Budapest Treaty on cybercrime, but there is also a network of cooperation through Interpol and elsewhere. So there are islands of norms, but they're loosely coupled. And the argument that somehow we should have some big UN treaty which would solve all this would probably set things back rather than there advance them when you have a domain that is as technologically diverse and dynamic as this. But what about interstate conflict? Is there any prospect of norms in that area? Um, there has, in fact, been some progress. A, a proposal that the Russians made in 1999 was to have a large UN treaty outlawing conflict in this area. Information and communications technology was the term the Russians wanted to use, not cyber. Uh, that got nowhere, but states did agree to set up a United Nations group of government experts which try to develop some rules of the road or norms, informal things, not treaties. And it met after 2004, it met a series of meetings and actually came up in 2015 with an interesting set of propositions. Rather than trying to outlaw certain weapons because it wasn't possible to say what was a program that was a weapon or not a weapon and be able to verify it, they said, let's out outlaw certain types of targets, such as targeting civilian infrastructure. And that got a fairly broad approval. It was the approved by the group of 20 most important uh, economies in the world. But in 2017, this UNGGE, as it was called, ran into a roadblock. The roadblock, uh, we should ask Marina, since she was a member of the group, but uh, the roadblock in my view, was largely a function of the sour relations between the United States and Russia. And that set things back. So there's something of a stalemate there, though we don't know how that's going to turn out. But before we become too discouraged, 
Let me point out that when you have a new disruptive technology, it takes states quite some time to develop norms or rules of the roads. Hiroshima was 1945, the Limited Test Ban Treaty was 1968, 63, and the Non-Proliferation Treaty was 1968. So a couple of decades before you have the first real progress in terms of getting rules or agreements. And even without that, you should note that you don't have to have global or universal agreements. You can have some that are global, some that are, if you want, plurilateral or groups of like-minded states, and some that are purely bilateral. For example, people would normally say you cannot get any agreement in espionage, and yet in 2015, uh, the United States and China agreed to not use cyber means for commercial espionage. In other words, don't steal secrets by cyber means to advantage your own companies. That is something which had been thought of as unthinkable, but it was endorsed by the Group of 20, and it has had some effect on Chinese activity. So is there progress? Yes. Slow and halting? Yes. But the argument that we're in a Wild West and that it doesn't make any sense to try to develop the social part of this defense mechanism at the international level, I think we have enough evidence that it's worth doing. And this commission, which we all are participating in, is to try to nudge that along as best we can. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, next up is Wolfgang. Maybe just also say just a little bit about your perspective or your experiences so we know kind of where you're coming from. Okay, uh, Jeff, thank you very much. You know, I'm an academic person. I am a, a research professor from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, but I was involved in the internet governance debate since the early days, in the 90s. I was a member of the board of ICANN and also a member of the United Nations Working Group on Internet Governance. And, you know, when Jeff gave a welcome speech uh, the day before yesterday, he remembered the good old times uh, from the 1990s when he said, OK, at this time we were only technology people in the room and we had the idea now we can rule the world. And I remember when uh, John Peter Barlow published his Declaration of Cyber Independence. So he even said, you know, governments of the old go home. So uh, we overtake uh, a lot of these functions. And the whole ICANN was based on the idea of a governance without government. And the question of power was not, was well, certainly in the room, but you know, the system, how the DNS is organized, is that all the power is on the edges and the knowledge. And the root server system in the middle is, has just the function to d deliver packets you know, from one place to another one, and is powerless. That means no central authority, no power in the center, all the power went to the edges. But as Jeff said yesterday, you know, after technology, you know, became, we came, saw this as a business case. With business came money. With money came the criminals. As with criminals came the governments. So <laughs> welcome back to the bad old times. <laughs> so now we are sitting here with a, with a new complexity and, you know, which is even more complex than it was 20 years ago. And again, you know, this is about power. You know, Toffler wrote in the, uh, in the early 90s a nice book about power shift. And Joe published a lot of papers that, you know, we see a diffusion of power, you know, from central authority to non-governmental actors and, 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 and to other players. And this is really the challenge we are facing now, that, uh, that power is in place, power is shifting. So we see a redistribution of power, and this is part of a power struggle. Before you reach a new distribution of power, you have a power struggle, and we are in the midst of this power struggle. And it's a very complex power struggle, because we have power struggle among states, we have power struggle among non-state actors, and the power struggle among 
states and non-state actors, and we see the emergence of all kinds of rainbow coalitions around various issues. So that means it's not just you know, that you can settle the problem with one silver bullet, so it's a very distributed system where you probably need solutions um, in a different way for different issues. So that this is what we call the internet governance ecosystem, which has no one single answer to uh, the, the very complex issue. And, uh, you know, can we learn something from the past? Probably, you know, I go to a, another former Harvard professor, Mr. Kissinger, when he wrote his PhD. Uh, he studied the Vienna Congress from 1813 to 1815, and his conclusion was, okay, if you want to have stability, you have to have a balance of power. So that means you do not push for an imbalance of power. So the balance of power has saved more or less stability in Europe of the uh, 19th century, you know, a number of decades. And, but this is very complex. Can we learn something from this? How to organize a balance of power among states, balance of power among non-state actors, and the balance of power among state actors and, and states. So this is really a big issue, and this commission is about the stability in cyberspace, and probably, or hopefully, we can in two years from now, you know, develop some ideas which are useful for the 2020s, because this is a long way to go, and you will not have a solution within the next two or three years. Thank you. Um, I come from a background of uh, law enforcement. I'm a retired commissioner of police from Singapore, and I was also the uh, president of Interpol from 2008 to 2012. This is a non-executive chairman of the board, and the uh, CEO is actually the secretary general. Now, I'd like to uh, speak from the perspective of law enforcement um, and use three quotes which I've come across. The first... Uh, was one from the previous Secretary General of the Interpol. He says, all international crime is local crime somewhere. That's true for most physical crimes, but actually we now know that in cyber, it is not true because in many countries, they don't even have laws uh, regarding cyber crime. So that you can straight away know that criminals will take advantage of uh, operating from these countries. The second one uh, is a quote which um, one of my colleagues have, has also, uh, used quite often. Cyber crime, uh, sorry, cyber criminals operate at the speed of light, while law enforcement moves at the speed of law. <laughs> uh, okay, I think this points out to the fact that we need treaties like the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty to get things done and, uh, you know, to, to, to get across a request to governments, to their foreign affairs ministry, will take ages, right? Um, and then the third one uh, is, it takes a network to fight a network. I think this originally referred to the uh, Islamic uh, state, but now, when you think about it, we are facing a network of very well-organized criminals. So how do we form our own networks? Uh, a network of trust. when when there's bilateral network uh, cooperation, there's regional cooperation, there's multilateral, and it, it's quite difficult because uh, in Interpol, um, we have 190 member states, and they include, well, Syria, <laughs> Iran, uh, Russia, China. In fact, the current president of Interpol is Chinese, and the vice presidents are Canadian, uh, Namibian, Russian and uh, South Korean. Of course, there are members uh, who are Americans. Uh, uh, there's an American member, there's a British uh, and Belgium. So it's quite international. We represent all the uh, continents. So how does this then help our efforts to fight cyber criminals uh, when you have such issues? Uh, who do you bring to your circle of friends? Do you work on a bilateral basis? Do you uh, work only among friends? Or do you include everyone? Now, when I was president of Interpol, I made the point to my government that we are a very small country. We can solve our own crimes within ourselves. In fact, our crime rate is very low, but cyber crime has been increasing. So how do we effectively control crime uh, within our own population? 
when the attacks come from overseas. So we sold them the idea that uh, we want to set up an Interpol global complex for innovation where we set up a cyber fusion center. And uh, when it opened in uh, April 2015, immediately there was a great success because Microsoft came to the center and said, we've got this Simda botnet. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. At that time, I think it infected 770,000 uh, computers and they were used to steal bank passwords and also uh, uh, inject malware into uh, Microsoft systems. So Interpol got, got together, the people, and then using the inter intelligence, uh, identified that the command and control centers were, surprise, surprise, based in the Netherlands and in the US <laughs> rather than uh, in China or in uh, Eastern Europe as it, previous botnets. So the operation took place and immediately what happened was the people behind it quickly moved to Russia, right? Because they knew that that would be where it would be, they'd be safe. So if it were a Europol operation or an FBI operation, I think it would have failed. But then this was Interpol. So, they called up the Russian uh, executive committee member who was from the uh, FSB and immediately they took action to, to shut down the, uh, the, the, the servers also. So this was a good example where instead of speed of law, it was probably a speed of a phone call. <laughs> and, but I think what's happened is in terms of prosecution and actually arresting those people, it is not that easy, right? You can shut down the botnet, but they can resurrect it. But how do you go further steps to get them in jail? And that is where a lot of work still needs to be done. And that's where I think uh, the law enforcement agencies and the governments will have to try to, to get their act together. Thank you. Bill? Hi, uh, I'm Bill Woodcock. Um, I guess. This is, the commission's a bit like the village people. I am the representative of the private sector network operators on the commission. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so my interest is really in how the internet infrastructure, which is essentially almost entirely private sector, owned, operated, financed, and so forth, um, can withstand the attacks that it's uh, faced with constantly. Um, a lot of what you're hearing from us is about coordination between sectors. So if you look at the coordination within the private sector, we've got NSPSEC, ANTI-S, INOC-DBA, a whole lot of different coordination mechanisms that work just fine that um, allow private sector to private sector cooperation to deal with uh, crime and mitigation of attacks and so forth. Um, when you look at private sector to law enforcement, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good and it's getting better all the time. Um, so that's not a, a big, it, it's a, a difficult thing. It's a problem area in the sense that there's a lot of work to be done, but it's not a problem area in the sense of something that's getting worse or something that needs particular remediation relative to other areas. So like one of, one of the areas where there's really good, interesting work being done there is um, Bertrand de la Chapelle's uh, Internet and Jurisdiction Project, where um, we're trying to harmonize the way law enforcement and the private sector communicate with each other at a protocol level such that law enforcement doesn't have to learn a different way of talking to Facebook than they talk to Apple, than they talk to LinkedIn, than they talk to Dropbox. Because right now, you've got this sort of babble of a thousand languages where uh, every law enforcement agency has to figure out how to coordinate with every different private sector organization. And since it all winds up back in two circuit courts in San Francisco and Seattle, it's not as complicated as it could be if it were all in different jurisdictions, really, uh, but it's still way more complicated than it needs to be. So again, it's an area where 10 years from now, we'll look back at, at how things are done right now and say, gosh, that was complicated. I'm glad we've got it you know, simplified to the point where we can address the inherent complexity rather than sort of the artificial complexity of the process. Where things really break down, though, 
is in the coordination between the private sector and the military. And you think, well, what do they have to do with each other? And that's the problem. Right now, there's a feedback loop that's not complete. So in militaries, offensive operations are rewarded and defensive operations are not. If you want a promotion, you go and you attack somebody. And even if you're not 100% successful, it'll look like you're out there doing something and you get a promotion or a little ribbon on your chest or a corner office or something, right? Whereas defense, it looks like you're not doing anything. You're spending more and more money every quarter and there's nothing coming back and nothing's happening and eventually somebody says, well, why don't we just take that money and use it to beat somebody up? That would be a lot more fun. Um, so that happens. It happens all the time. We've got law enforcement uh, you know, trying to deal with criminals at the same time that militaries are doing exactly the same things that criminals are. And now, suddenly, everybody's got this additional layer of complexity of, well, was that a criminal act or was that a military act? If it was military, gosh, we just got to let them do it because sovereignty, right? Um, it, this, uh, this thing of allowing governments to do things that are clearly defined as crimes because sovereignty makes life really, really difficult for the private sector, right? Because now the private sector has to start understanding attribution in a way that they don't have to if it's all just a crime. Um, we have then this problem of blowback, right? So not only are governments attacking private sector operated infrastructure, then there's blowback because now that infrastructure is in some country that decides that it's going to counterattack you know, in order to penalize the country that attacked in the first place. Under military theory, that's pretty good, right? That's how you would do it. Except that what they're counterattacking is not the government, because the government doesn't have significant cyber assets. It's the private sector, because that's where the internet is. So now you've got a, a blowback against the attack that was conducted from the first country, and so there, there are huge, huge losses to the private sector in that first country as a consequence of the attack that their government is prosecuting. But there's no feedback loop to tell that government you shouldn't be out there kicking hornet's nests, right? Because there's no responsibility there. There's no feedback loop to get militaries to stop kicking those hornet's nests. Um, just to give an indication of just how bad a problem this is, my, my network operations is, is to do with the DNS and with internet exchange points. And in both cases, we're looking at a thousand times over provisioning to deal with cyber attacks. So if we compare the amount of traffic that's running through the infrastructure for legitimate use to the amount of infrastructure that's necessary to withstand these attacks, there's a thousand times difference. We're having to buy a thousand times more equipment, a thousand times larger equipment to deal with the malicious use as opposed to the legitimate use. That is a huge, huge infrastructural cost. I was about to say investment. It's not an investment. That's just a cost. There's nothing we get back from that. That is not serving legitimate use. So I think the where, we, where we're trying to go with this as a commission is towards norms that would declare cyber attack against critical infrastructure to be outside the realm of the reasonable in the same way that kinetic attacks against hospitals and schools are outside the realm of the reasonable. And if we can get to the point where that's globally understood and acknowledged, even if there are a few countries that are bad actors, then there will be a lot more leverage for getting it stopped. Are you? Well, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I'm really honored to be in this panel and, and to cheer the commission. I come from Estonia. For those who haven't heard about it, it's a country. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a country club with 1.3 million of population, and we're working on that. We're trying to attract more e-residents to come to Estonia and to provide them digital services we're providing to our people. What do I hope to bring to the Commission 
first, what have I experienced nationally, but also the international dimension. I'm former Estonian foreign minister. I'm a former career diplomat. I've been posted as ambassador to Russia, to US, Canada, Mexico, Kazakhstan, Israel. And now I'm chairing the commission. Uh, a couple of facts about Estonia so that you won't forget it. Skype was invented by Estonian guys. <laughs> Estonia is the first country in the world to introduce paperless e-government. Estonia is the first country in the world to introduce internet voting, and we're still doing it, also in November this year. <laughs> and Estonia is the first country in the world to introduce digital signatures nationwide. With population 1.3 million, we have given more than 250 million digital signatures. Experts say it saves us five working days annually, 2% of GDP. Our defense expenditure is 2% which means defense comes free. <laughs> uh, Black Hat is celebrating this year its 20th anniversary. Back in Estonia, we kind of celebrated 10 years of the first cyber attack to an independent country being politically motivated. Yes, those were cyber attacks on Estonia. We learned our lessons nationally and internationally. Nationally. The driving force when talking about cybersecurity has to be government. But government can't be efficient if it doesn't cooperate with private sector and other stakeholders, academia, IT experts, and others. We were lucky. 2007 IT geeks, the guys whom we can never afford as a government, came to assist the government. Some were local ones, some were foreigners, but they came to assist the Estonian government. And since then, we have the example of public-private partnership, the example of Cyber Defense League. Internationally, 2007, I was Estonian ambassador in Moscow. So during the cyber attacks, I tried to find ways of cooperating. As you can guess, I failed. I couldn't. But we understood that cyber does not have borders. And that's why international cooperation is crucial. International cooperation in different organizations. Some of the international cooperations have been successful ones. I can say the European Organization of Security and Cooperation with confidence building measures, NATO with defense, even EU with digital markets, although it's far, far from being perfect. And some have failed. Joe mentioned one, is the United Nations. Yes, UN failed a month ago to have an agreement between different countries on stability and security of cyberspace, more precisely on international law. Cyberspace is not a jungle. International law applies. We agreed that already in 2013. The question today is how international law applies. And these are the questions that we hope to address in the Commission. Cybersecurity has become a new, not only a new challenge, but part of security. If we talk about security, we are talking more and more about cybersecurity. The more ambiguous zones there are, the more there are possibilities for misunderstanding each other, for provocations. The more gray zones we have in application of international law, the more there are attempts to touch the boundaries like we're seeing with interference in international elections or cutting off power grids, events that are happening around us on a daily basis. I'm a lawyer. I believe in international law, but also I believe in norms. Not legally binding norms, but norms of responsible state behavior. Today, globally, we don't have any forums to discuss it with multi-stakeholders. The four, as I mentioned, are for states and governments. But this commission is unique. Professors from Denmark, US, former Interpol boss, <laughs> IT experts, and majority of the commission is sitting at the front line. With this powerful group, I very much hope that we'll be able to develop and introduce and convince states to adopt some norms of responsible state behavior. And we're very happy to have Jeff with us. 
<laughs> holding down the fort here. Okay, so um, I've got just a couple kind of opening questions to get the, the dialogue moving and then we're going to move into some questions and answers. And um, one is, I don't know if I'm trolling Bill or, or some of the other members here, but um, on norms there's sort of this meme in the security community online uh, floating around that while we're all debating norms, Google and Twitter and Facebook are building norms. That there's another set of norms out there that are being formulated de facto by these, you know, the, the way that patch management is managed, the way that Microsoft does things are creating sort of these institutional norms that now the governments are having to react to. So now governments are in the passenger seat, not the driver's seat. Do you see that flipping? Do you ever see a situation? Um, and I'll, I'll go to whoever's got a, a comment. So I would look back to sort of the 1980s and how device management worked back then. And for every kind of router, every kind of switch, there was a separate management console. And communications was proprietary. And there was no hope of getting unified management across a spectrum of devices, right? And then there was SNMP. And Everybody said, gosh, that'll never work. It's too complicated. Uh, you know, vendors will never start all talking the same language uh, because it wouldn't be in their interest. They all each have their silo, and as long as they can defend their silo, they've got customers locked in and so forth. And that's where we are right now with uh, coordination. You know, Facebook says, you know, everybody in the world has to come and fill out our form and justify themselves to us thus and such way. And then Google says, not invented here, we do it this way, and here's our form, and here's what the information we want, and here's what we'll respond to. And, you know, Apple says something different. And it's, that's not going to work in the long term, right? The, the big, huge market dominant companies saying, you know, our way is the only way, and we have so many customers that we can just dictate to the world is not going to persist. And I think we have lots and lots of examples in history of uh, increased communications, increased sort of globalization leading towards a harmonized uniform way that everyone expects to do things globally over time. And so I don't think 10 years from now we're still going to be having to deal with individual private sector companies saying, no, no, my way is the only way. Right, they'll have adopted harmonize. Joe? Well, I, I agree with what Bill just said, but I think that uh, it's worth noticing that companies are not going to be in quite as much control as people think. Uh, going back to John Perry Barlow in the 90s with this view that governments get out of the way, uh, it, what the trends have been is just the opposite. The trends have been to try to increase the role of sovereign states inside cyberspace. And if you ask to what extent is Google stronger than the government of China, the answer is pretty clear. Google's not China. It once was, but they kicked them out. And if you ask has Mark Zuckerberg with all his billions of subscribers been able to get Facebook into China, the answer is no. One of our commissioners, Jim Lewis, who's not here this, right now, has said that for the last dozen years or so, the major trend in cyberspace has been the increased role of sovereign governments. And I think when we talk about the so companies getting stronger and stronger, we're missing that point. Yeah. I don't particularly think that's a good thing, even though I once worked for the Defense Department and the State Department, in addition to being a Harvard professor, I've had some government experience. I don't celebrate that. I think it's actually too bad. But as an analyst, somebody who's written a lot of books about power internationally, those are the facts. Yeah, I don't think the power struggle is between government and individual private sector companies. I think ultimately the power struggle that matters is between governments and multi-stakeholderism. Um, and then the other question I had, we talked about a little bit briefly at lunch because it's gotten a bit of news coverage, was this the vulnerabilities equity program in the U.S. government of sharing when do you share zero days, when is a government expected to share it with a, maybe an affected party. Um, 
and uh, the VEP program has been up and running for a little bit. Uh, a lot of people, since it's classified, are speculating as to its effectiveness. Can any of you talk to sort of uh, do you see that as the future of trying to diffuse some of the pressures, this inequality between the private sector and these militaries that are rewarded for purely offensive operations? Is this part of that feedback loop that Bill is maybe talking about? I think that's a really a complex issue, and uh, John Neutzer from Microsoft is here. Uh, Microsoft has proposed this uh, Geneva Convention, uh, Digital Geneva Convention, which includes a special arrangement on a new, they called it attribution organization. And so this gets, um, on the one hand, it's a very reasonable proposal if you see all the attacks and so that you would be good to have a neutral, impartial organization like the IAEA in Vienna, which looks into the scene and says, you know, where something comes from and so that you have more data. The problem is that it goes really to the heart of um, intelligence and, and other secret information. Just two weeks ago, there was a conference, the Cyber Security Week in Israel, and there was a good debate between uh, Microsoft and Chris Painter, who was, uh, has now its last days in the State Department. And while um, Microsoft argued, you know, we have good information, which is probably useful, uh, Painter replied, Yes, you have good information, but not all information. So, and that's the problem. So that means if you have only good information, probably that's not sufficient to have a final uh, fixed answer for the attribution. So that means there is a gap. Mm. Uh, how this can be settled, probably, if you introduce, let's say, a, a, a confidential layer into such an organization. This could uh, be you know, one step forward. So here, innovation in a political uh, thinking is also uh, you know, uh, needed. So uh, I remember when I was in the United Nations Working Group on Internet Governance uh, uh, 15 years ago, Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations, argued the Internet is uh, the result of a technical innovation, but in policy, we do not have innovation. We deal with new issues, with instruments from the old times. So we need more political innovation. And in so far, you know, with all the doubts I have with the Microsoft proposal, I think this challenges us, us to think about innovative, about future political frameworks, mechanisms, which has to be based, and I think this is also very important, on the multi-stakeholder approach. That means it cannot be done by governments alone. It cannot be done by the private sector alone. Mm -hmm. You need a certain form of collaboration among stakeholders if you want to have a sustainable solution. I think as, as the private sector guy, I'm going to say something that will make me unpopular with my uh, colleagues here. But I think there's a moral question here, and I think it's a fairly simple one. I think that military and intelligence folks will often use the rationale. We have secrets. And if you knew what we knew, you would make the same hard decisions that we have to make, and you would come off looking like a bad guy, too. You would have to kill people. You would have to steal things, so forth, right? You would have to do things that are on their face morally unpalat unpalatable. But they can't justify that using publicly available information only using secrets, which you're not entitled to, therefore you cannot judge them. And I think that is just morally bankrupt. I don't think that's a valid argument. I think that we live in a world where public information is the only information that matters in the long run. And if you do something, if you attack someone, if you hoard zero days, whatever, that is not in the public interest, coming back and saying, well, if only I could tell you my secrets that allow me to feel good about the thing that I'm doing, even though it's obviously morally unpalatable, that's a worthless argument from my point of view. Marina? I just, uh, just to very briefly elaborate on what Wolfgang said. Personally, I'm very skeptical about any new conventions, any new institutions. Being in foreign, having been in foreign policy now for more than 20 years, very often, it's a possibility to postpone fulfilling of what we have today. We have international law. Let's look into that, 
if we find something missing, then at some point we might come to the new law. New international organization. Can you imagine any state giving up state sovereignty on attribution to an international organization? I don't think so. At least my government is not. Because at the moment, yes, I agree that there has to be close cooperation. As I said, private sector, academia, expert, it has to be there. But giving attribution, such a sensitive question, not only technically, but also legally and politically to somebody else, I doubt very much about it. OK, we want to go to some questions. So if anybody has them, we have two microphones set up over here. Uh, three microphones, I'm sorry. Uh, first come, first serve, and this gentleman is the winner. Great. Um, you're from Estonia, and so... Oh, wait, how, uh, just say your name oh, and where you're from. Uh, uh, John Haas from Embry-Riddle University in Prescott, Arizona, just a neighbor. And uh, the Estonia has now Talon version 2.0, which is a group of rules, essentially, and uh, based on Talon 1. And I'd be curious to have everyone's comment on that document because it is something that's been worked on for a while, and it's, we're even in a second version. Why can't we start with something like that and then improve it? Jeff, may I start? Yes, please. Uh, just for those who don't know, Tallinn Manual is a compilation of uh, international law, application of international law, written by 19 experts of international law. So it has nothing to do with the official positions of NATO, although it's, uh, it was done under the umbrella of NATO Center of Excellence, and it does not include national positions of government. 19 lawyers have proposed how to apply international law. 600 pages. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, very difficult to read. <laughs> but I agree that now we need the next step. What's, what the next step should be? Next step should be 200 pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> legal advisors, legal advisors advising governments, MFAs, ministries of justice, ministries of defense should look into that and start applying. We can't apply, even if we want. Only governments can apply international law. So now it's up to governments. So if there are legal advisors in the group, I encourage everybody to buy it, to look into that, and to say what you like and what you don't. Sir? I think you had a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I Just a, a quick footnote, Jeff, which is yeah. Talon Manual is a huge, important step forward. But the Russians and the Chinese don't accept it. And if we're talking about international law that's going to be applicable, it's got to get beyond just the like-minded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you consider a, a zero- Oh, wait, just introduce yourself a oh, little sorry, bit. Sorry, uh, Bill Koges. I work for Strat Solutions, a small business consulting company in Maryland. Um, so if, if you look at a, a zero day, um, is basically a cyber weapon, because that's sort of how it's being treated right now, right? Com or countries or nation states or companies or organizations create them, they hoard them, they use them, right? Um, so I, I think what we're trying to say when you want to companies or, or, or nation states to disclose them is to disarm themselves. Do you think it's realistic that you know, the US, for instance, will want to disarm itself in a, in a time when you know, China or Russia or whoever you know, is probably not going to go that way, right? We, can't, we, can, we can do sanctions with kinetic weapons, right? Um, but you might say it doesn't really seem to make a difference. Um, so do you think it's realistic in the future to, to, to really expect nation states to do that with zero days? OK, who wants to take that? I'm looking at you, Joe. Well, <laughs> let's think for a second about would you really want to live in a world in which you had no ability to deter Russians and Chinese who have used cyber weapons against Estonia, against Georgia, against Ukraine, and who have a reputation for having penetrated the American grid? Do you want NSA to have zero, zero days? Uh, probably not. And that's why I think Bill's comment earlier that the people who defend that are morally bankrupt, they don't see it that way. If you go back to what Alex Stamos talked about this morning of trying to understand the mentality of those who are seeing defense in a slightly different way, I don't think they are morally bankrupt. I do think hiding behind secrecy about how much they have to keep or hoard is a different question, and we ought to think of better procedures for reducing that.
But just to categorize them as morally bankrupt, I think is not an adequate way of phrasing the proposition. The question is, wouldn't we all be better off if we hoarded a lot less? We can disarm many criminals. We can disarm many Russian tools by essentially being much tighter in the number of zero days that we keep. But zero, zero days, in my mind, is a little bit like zero nuclear weapons. There are people, there's a treaty now in the UN for zero nuclear weapons. I personally would not feel safer. I think Joe and I could argue for a long time about sort of the <laughs> specifics of this stuff. Um, I think that we're in agreement on that last, that uh, if, if there are, say, 100 governments that are all trying to accumulate zero days, and we can reduce the number of zero days in existence by finding and fixing vulnerabilities, then in relative terms, we have made the world a better place because we have reduced the stockpiles of the other 99 countries collectively far more than we've reduced our own stockpile, if you want to look at it from a national perspective. And I think um, rather than looking at zero days as weapons, looking at them from an open source perspective as problems that need to be fixed is perhaps more productive. It gets us to where we want to be a little better in that more eyes on the code, more eyes on the problem leads to a faster, better solution. And if we can have more people looking at the problems and helping to solve them, we move more people from the secret making and hoarding problems side to the solving problems and moving forward side. So I guess my argument would be that insofar as, for instance, the NSA has people who are dedicated to finding and solving problems and people who are dedicated to finding and hoarding problems, moving people more into that first category makes the world a better place and makes us stronger relative to the people who would attack us. I think we agree on that. Good. <laughs> Beer. Um, okay, one quick last question. I'm sorry we're not going to have time for our last person in line there. Uh, yeah, my name's Sean Waterman. I'm a reporter. I've been writing about cybersecurity for uh, more than a decade now. And I wanted to ask about the vulnerability equities process because, um, you know, one of the interesting things about it is that no other country has one, as far as I know. I mean, does Estonia have one? Um, I, I imagine that the Estonian intelligence services are finding and hoarding zero days as the other you know, more than 100 uh, countries that are now developing cyber war capabilities. Uh, how important is it that there's some sort of reciprocity or generalization of these? Obviously, the United States is in a, uh, a unique position uh, for a number of different reasons, but how important is, the, is, is some sort of reciprocity in, these, uh, in, in, in that particular arrangement, you know, as it is in, in, in all of these other issues we've talked about, like, you know, putting malware on okay. infrastructure and so forth? Thank you. Does Estonia have a VEP that you can talk about? Um, not a strategy like you describe, as to describing it, not, not, not that one. Singapore, that you know of? Well, it's no secret, I don't think they even tell me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah? Yeah, probably, you know, uh, when Joe mentioned, that Hiroshima was in 1945, and it took 18 years to the Test Ban Treaty, and another five years to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and another five years to the first Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, which was a bilateral agreement, and another five years until in Vladivostok, you know, both sides opened their photos and said, we know what you know, and we know what you, you know. So that means this created a certain balance which was the basis for further reductions. So, and I think this is what I mentioned with the, um, you know, if we, um, you know, if we are in a zero-sum game, then it's difficult to reach an agreement. 
uh, if we are in a um, win-win situation or where we try to identify mutual interests, then we can, even if we have different opinions or, you know, states hate each other, we can define a certain layer where we have common interests. I think it's an interest of all sides to protect hospitals against cyber uh, attacks. So that means we can single out this layer. Uh, the, 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 the agreement between China and, and, and the US, which was mentioned, you know, no cyber espionage. So that means if you define the whole system into layers and you try to find you know, some solutions for the different layers, you have still a big body where you have no agreement, but you, know, you, make, you, know, you have more, probably not 100%, but 80% is better than 60%, and even 60% is better than 40%, and 0% is really bad. <laughs> all right, well, with that, I'm going to uh, close the session. I want to warmly thank everybody, all the panelists here. And like we mentioned earlier, in the front row here, we have a lot of the uh, GCSC commissioners uh, will be around. And uh, we're holding a session, thanks to Black Hat. We'll be here all day tomorrow holding a meeting. And just come up, talk to us. Love to talk to you about what we're doing. Thank you so much for paying attention and coming on out. <laughs>